Hi, welcome to the Art in Arlington series. My name is Leonard Diggins and I'm the producer. Often I like to go to open studios and meet artists and learn about how they became artists and the inspiration behind the pieces that they create. Producing this series gives me motivation to get out and meet artists that have a connection to Arlington, whether they grew up in Arlington, they now live in Arlington, they work in Arlington, they create their art in Arlington, they exhibit their art in Arlington, whatever. As I said, it's motivation to get out and meet those artists and then share what I learned about them and from them with you. The first artist in this series is Eric Love of LARP Adventure Program. LARP stands for Live Action Role Play. And you may wonder, what does Live Action Role Play have to do with art? Well, I think you'll find the answer that Eric gives to that question and his thoughts on a variety of topics to be very interesting. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for watching. Well, thanks, Eric. And uh, you want to tell me a bit about uh, the organization? Okay. Uh, the organization that I'm a part of is called LARP Adventure Program. And LARP is an acronym for Live Action Role Play. And essentially, it is a theater-based gaming organization of art at the surface level. And, and how, how long has it been in existence? Um, it started up as a concept um, in early 2000 and kind of came into what it would dedicate itself to in 2002. And in Arlington, it started to develop here in 2008 and has extremely flourished into a multi-generational experience for the Arlington community, including somewhere near about 100 families. So what was the inspiration for it? Uh, I think the inspiration for it was I was teaching art, I was involved in the arts, I was involved in performing arts, um, and I think I was getting bored. I just felt like there wasn't something that could entertain all my different interests as an interdisciplinary artist. So when I saw LARP, it was very engaging, uh, it was very compelling. Uh, my first LARP experience, I had a flu, and I probably should have been in the hospital, but it was just so awesome that I stayed up all night and ran around. And that, to me, was amazing because the drive that it created, it really blew me away. I mean, I can go to a concert and hang out for three hours. I can go to an art show and hang out for three hours, but I did this thing for 24 hours at my first go and left wanting more. And so, to me, that hunger and that desire to be around that art created... Uh, a spark to be a part of that. Okay, so, so you did mention, you know, that that kind of, of art, mm -hmm. and, and and when I think about what you say and what you're describing, I see it in, as more gaming, almost live action gaming, as you described. Mm -hmm. So, so um, what would you say is the connection, you know, between this and art, as as most people, you know, think of art, or do we have to expand our boundaries of what we think is art? Well, a little bit of history can help. So we had tabletop gaming develop in the 70s. Um, Gary Gygax, a name one person, and the Dungeons and Dragons series, the Shadowrun series. Uh, Sci-fi and fantasy became something that you could play in your basement and interactive storytelling with books, with rules, with logic-based skills. But part of those logic-based skills was not just the math and kind of figuring out how to beat the puzzle but the aesthetics that were on top of that what did my character look like what did they sound like what kind of person were they what kind of social skills did they have how do they interact with people and how did the world interact with that character or sometimes you had a game with you know anywhere up to six to eight players and all these characters interacting so that became the art and so when theater people got a hold of this game they said to themselves well why can't we just do this live action why do we have to be at a table and so groups like the Society for Creative Anachronisms, or the SCA, um, also Anne Rice was very popular for this. And this goes back to old Victorian games as well and masquerades, said let's do a game mechanic so that there's kind of this even balance rule that we all agree on, but let's dress up and be other characters. And so it was really about dressing up and taking on a persona of someone else and a theatrical art and presenting different arts within your character but there was a game floor presence. So it was always an art game to begin with. 
Uh, yeah, and t different people now, they want to go more game route. Some people go no game route and just art. And so you have a full spectrum in the LARP culture between uh, battle mechanics, art, and what people call Nordic LARP in Europe, which is more, there is really no ground rules to win. It's just about the acting and creating a theatrical environment that completely immerses you. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, so uh, it seems now, my understanding then is that uh, this is for pretty much any age group. I mean, what would you say is the age age range that you know um, participate in it? It's just funny you ask that because when I got into this, there I didn't know that anyone was doing this with youth, and it seemed like everyone's like, "You can't do this with youth." I mean, it wasn't until we had Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings that kind of the stigma that was put on Dungeons and Dragons even in the 70s because it had strange dice that it was some form of cult or Satanism or some kind of strange projection um, or you know that combat would be unhealthy a lot of people have this idea well if you do martial arts you'll become a violent person when you know in my experience of doing martial arts for over 30 years it makes you a very tranquil calm person and in fact if you have tendencies of rage or aggression that actually subdues it and gives it an outlet and so there's a lot of you know, projections that this would be unhealthy for children. It would make them violent. It would make them dangerous. It would make them, you know, cultists or something strange. Um, so that had to roll off. And I think the Harry Potter, again, Lord of the Rings, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movie culture phenomenons uh, helped, you know, our culture say, oh, okay, this is all right. Because uh, when I tried to start LARP in the 2000s, I it was challenged. I got shut down many times. People said it was too dangerous. It was too hard to do. But to come to find out, there are some youth LARP organizations in the United States. Europe is, say, anywhere from 10 to 20 years ahead of us in this industry. Um, and so they've had that. Uh, probably, I think the first uh, organized Europe LARP I heard of was in 1996. Um, so, but I'm sure it was there beforehand in backyards, not too. So yeah, for kids it was unheard of, and it's a very complex game to play, and it takes a lot of self-control. So unless you teach children to have personal moral compasses and develop self-control and discipline, courtesy and modesty, they, they can't do it. And if, I've seen people who do do LARP with kids and don't teach those skills, and it is a dangerous potential environment. Um, but having the martial arts background, having the fine and performing arts background, enabled me to come into this with an action plan that worked from day one. Well, that's interesting. You mentioned the danger of it, eh, but could it also maybe be used, eh, I don't know if the right word is therapeutically, but, but let's say you have a kid you know, that maybe is having problems um, developing social skills. I mean, could this be something that could be used to create maybe a safe space for them in which to learn the skills that they're having problems developing? you know, in everyday life? You know, you're absolutely right. So there's studies that are coming out on what's called edgy LARP or education LARP. Um, there's some websites on, uh, there's some links on our website that you can take a look at. And there's some files on Facebook I can point you up. But what we're finding is anyone who does LARP learns to have what's considered 21st century skills, learning how to be social better, how to interact with people better, how to come out and be authentic better and have self-confidence. And there's also a whole series of studies that people with, um, you know, with intellectual or um, developmental disabilities, uh, ADHD, uh, autism, any spectrum type label that you find in psychology, that the proper LARP environment is actually helping them move forward drastically. Uh, so we're seeing that whether you have disabilities or not, live action role playing is helping you develop as a person and reach and find your goals faster in life. And my attitude about that is, well, of course it does. It's like the holodeck on the Star Trek. If you synthesize an experience and you practice doing it, then when you go to do it in real life, you will be better at it. So if I'm a shy person and I want to come out, if I can, my character can go out and be, you know, very popular, charismatic person, but that's not me. So my ego kind of lets go of that for a second. And I can go have a weekend where I practice being outgoing as someone who's not me. Okay, now I go back to my regular life and I say, how did I like that? Well, I actually like the things that happened when I did this, but I didn't like these things. So now I can apply to my personal life what I experienced in that LARP and I can move forward in a way that feels comfortable and safe for me. 
Um, so whether you're a very successful person in business um, or you're just starting to figure out who you are in your job, your personality, your relationships, uh, what you want to do in the world, live action role playing in the proper uh, aesthetic for you, whether it's a fantasy, apocalypse, 1920s, whatever attracts to you will give you a space to kind of like flex your physical, emotional, and intellectual muscles in a way that can bring you to another level of your personality. And what's great is we have statistics about this. Um, I wish I was involved in this project and I don't have the name of it offhand right now, but they took a lot of underserved um, community folks and had them do LARP for just a week. And these kids had no interest in any academic subjects. Within a week after doing LARP, they were excited to do math, science, social studies, wanted to learn, wanted to do better in school, and their grades improved, and that was just a week of doing LARP. So you can imagine what it could do for anybody in whatever venture they're looking to do in their life to excel and bring themselves forward. That's the long explanation. I no, that was, good. that was very good. That was very good. I mean, that was very interesting. And, uh, and, and hmm, hmm, very interesting. And... Um, uh, and that, that made me also think about something that I had read on your website regarding multiple intelligences. And, uh, and, and I know that maybe we might be pushing you know, the, the um, limits of, of your expertise, so I don't want to you know, make you say something that you're uncomfortable <laughs> talking about. But if you can expand on that a little bit, because it seems like that goes beyond simply you know, helping people who may have difficulties you know, dealing with a... Um, just everyday life, but it might be a way of just kind of helping us understand that people learn in different ways. I mean, and this could you know, help explore other ways of helping people learn. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, it's interesting. I'm not, uh, you know, I don't haven't studied all of Gardner's Howard Gardner's ideas on multiple intelligence, and you know, I believe he's still here working at a Harvard. Uh, was, uh, I think, zero-something education, which is kind of a reform of education, a way to look at it. But it was interesting for me because when I first got introduced to multiple intelligence, uh, I was in high school, and standardized testing was about to come down the pipes, and I kind of just dodged that because I graduated in 1996. Um, and our psychology teacher was talking about multiple intelligence theory and how you know there's these standardized tests coming out and they're only testing one piece of a pie of intelligence and who you are as a person and that's going to become the standard for you in all cases of life and so there was this immediate push from Gardner's ideas to be like to say you can't you know just put someone in a little box like not everyone's a square peg uh, that's going to fit through a square hole there might be triangles there might be circles there might be star shapes and to kind of ring the bell to say this isn't going to work and here we are you know uh, all these years later with child left behind and all these other great ideas about education and everyone's frustrated and furious and with technology changing it's just not standing up to people's needs uh, parents are mad students are mad teachers are mad people running the schools are mad people in the state are mad everyone's mad uh, and they aren't finding a resolution and but there's schools that are you know experimenting and taking these risks and it is a scary risk and they're working with uh, multiple intelligence theory uh, which then brought about 21st century skills and the label of that and then we have this new thing called stem learning right and you know that all comes from Gardner's ideas uh, but you know we love our buzzwords like we love our coffee and um, so this multiple intelligence is that there is, I believe, music and sound. There's picture intelligence. There is logic intelligence. There is uh, social intelligence, personal developments like yourself, how aware of you are of yourself. And I believe naturalism. And I, I might be missing a few. Um, but LARP and live action role playing naturally addresses all of those at once. And so when you are live action role playing, you are doing a full spectrum, according to Gardner. Of intelligences to play the game and of course some of us are better at some than others I might be great at rules someone else might be great at art or someone else is really great at being social in the game and I'm really shy and quiet you know but we all come together and can share in this one arena of our academic skills and we're all seen as equals you can't do that in a standard school right now you know you're in math class and you're either good at it or bad you're in you know history you're either good at it or bad and 
there's not this playing field where how do we bring everyone's skills in? And some teachers are doing it like, okay, you're an artist. How about you draw a scene from history for us to help us understand it? That is a visual person's gift to give to the entire class. Someone else be, might be a, great at music and can create songs um, in themes and environments from that time. Say we're studying the Civil War and we're on a march and they're going to play a specific song. Being immersed in those environments will rapidly uh, bring you forward and give you the tools to sync everything you're learning in. I mean, I talk to most children and ask them, do you remember anything from your test last year or what you learned? And they say no. And I've been doing that for 20 years now. So what is sticking and what's not? If I ask somebody what they did in an event that they really loved and that they were immersed in, imagine like Disney World uh, for most people or an amazing theater event or a life-changing experience, um, maybe there was something dangerous involved or something spectacular, you remember it like it was yesterday. So where is education and its longevity? Are we just getting people to jump through hoops and then the next day that information's gone and we've just trained them well to jump through hoops? Are we going to give them data and information that they can call upon later in life and use in all situations. And so I think that is what Gardner is touching upon and how multiple intelligence theory works. Yeah, it seems like it's a good way to maybe, you know, get, you know, gym mean and art, you know, back into the curriculum because my understanding is that a lot of schools are dropping those for lack of resources, I mean, and, and if that's kind of incorporated into the overall learning process, it might be a way to bring those back into it but hey i'm commenting now and <laughs> no man, no it's I, just, no it's interesting because yeah. you bring up some ideas for me so there's this whole thing that that i faced since i was in school it was like you know in the art room we're dealing with old brushes and junky gear but i kind of liked that but you know some of it was horrible and wasn't usable and we'd have some art projects that you know oh we can barely afford pencils in a high school fine arts curriculum that's like just ridiculous and uh, the arts and music are kind of like pushed to the side as like these are just things that entertain people and are not important. And, um, you know, and then the other argument is like, well, you know, art makes culture and it makes people happier and it makes things better. And that's why we see gentrification of areas. You know, artists move into an area in a city, they all build it up, they make it nice, and then everyone wants to move there. And then you push all the artists out, of course, right? Because that's, that's the trend that happens uh, for whatever reason and we haven't learned to stop that. Um, and, but people want art because when they're surrounded by art, they're just going to learn and have a better life. People want music because it makes them happy. It makes you learn better. It makes you do your job better. It makes you socialize better. Um, so these things that we're kind of saying, oh, they're not important. Um, it's cause we're looking at only one goal. And so what is that goal? We have to ask ourselves, what is it that we've accomplished um, in the last hundred years as a country and you know for better or worse like we you know I think America is an amazing country with some amazing opportunities and um, is vibrant and strong and dynamic and of course it has its blemishes and um, we can do some great amazing things and now it's like okay now that we've done that now what do we want to do you know there's times in my life where I can't focus on creating storyline and making props I just have to sit at the computer and grind away and do emails maybe for two years at a time and that's okay in human evolution if we need to take 20 30 40 years to do something like that but at what point do you say okay that was a temporary solution to get through a hard problem this is not how life is supposed to be um, you know before Nixon we had the National Endowment of the Arts and if you were willing to make art and share it with people and decorate areas the government would pay for you to have a living like you could just make art and get by have your rent food and expenses covered and now who gets the National Endowment of the Arts look it up see who gets it do they really need that money I don't know and um, and that's just a general judgment I have, but it's, you know, where at one point, even in our country, we understood, uh, much like Egyptian culture did, which was fantastic, and Greek culture did, and even Roman culture, that art is important and people need it to feel successful and feel good about themselves. And you can't make culture happen. There's no button. You have to build an infrastructure and then it grows like moss on a rock and you just hope it sticks around. Um, so there's this little game that we play where we just make enough art, there's just enough art centers or organizations like ours that are, you know, essentially a private LLC, uh, that are just operating and the parents that can afford it can do it. 
And that just seems ridiculous to me. It's creating greater cultural divides. You know, it creates, when people don't have a way to express themselves or have aesthetics in their lives that make them happy, of course they're going to be depressed. Of course they're going to be angry. And of course they're going to want to fight back because they're not getting what they need. Um, and I, I understand art isn't going to make money in the business room. And that was a hard lesson for me. I never wanted to learn how to do business, but I had to. And that was a great skill, you know. And some artists want to stay, like, in the aloofness of being an artist because when you're there, I personally think the creative process is easier because you're more connected to your intuition and the muses, per se, and your, your, uh, your Juno or genius and a Greek uh, philosophy. But, you know... You can't do that as an artist and survive because people will just beat you down and take advantage of you now. And that's kind of sad that that's the situation that it is, but maybe that's just evolution and survival of the fittest, someone might say. Uh, but yeah, it, it's disheartening and, it's, and it's, it's hard because we have a place in culture for our hyper-intelligent people and our tech people now, especially because we love technology. Oh, we love it. It's so great. It's so awesome. I love it. And these people are allowed to be aloof and live their kind of quirky lifestyles and they'll be supported and they can live well and amazingly Silicon Valley, you go to California, yeah, it's quite a beautiful lifestyle, right, for them. But for people who are doing these other decorative things, the expectation is, well, you can have the scraps and struggle. I mean, there's such amazing artists um, in the world right now and, you know, they're living in, uh, you know, maybe like, in this place in Oakland and they're barely getting by and they're having to ask for money online so they can buy groceries. And it's like, why, why did we get to this point? Um, so I don't know if it's just that economics need to get better. So people are like, okay, I can move beyond my Maslow survival needs and get into like investing in humanities and the arts again, because I have extra money. So I'll go out and do something besides a movie or is it that technology has surpassed that and all we want to do is listen to mp3s and watch movies and we really don't want to see a live dance or a theater experience or maybe we don't even know what that looks like because we've never been exposed to that so we don't have a value to invest into that and so these are these are great questions and you know i don't take it personally if someone i was trying to trained as a painter first and that's probably my best skill but i just don't paint anymore because people aren't interested in paintings and that's okay because we have cool iphones and projectors and we can go see laser shows and you know, go to festivals, and um, I, I get that, but I still love painting, and I'll never stop doing it, um, and so, you know, part of me is, like, just, you know, you have to work with culture and evolve with culture, but at the same time, is it that culture has just forgotten what art is because it's not exposed to it anymore, and it doesn't have it, and so we've gotten used to these other Band-Aid supplements, or, you know, maybe uh, it's just better, I don't know, so that's kind of, like, the the paradigm shift that I'm trying to work with myself and what has driven me to do certain art and not do other art. I see. I see. So it's a long rant. Wow. I guess okay. I had some things to say there. Yeah, I think you did. That's good. <laughs> a little so, opinionated. I got some judgments and feelings. Yeah, that's, that's quite all right. And, and so, so uh, well, it makes, it makes, at least for me, you know, an entertaining video and I hope the, the people watching this feel the same way. And, uh, and, and um, I think it, kind of wrapping this up perhaps you yeah. know uh you can tell me like what activities there are for uh kids and maybe even adults are uh, um in larp i mean in the arlington area mm -hmm. or in the surrounding area so luckily you we live in new england and new england is one of the biggest hubs for live action role playing in the United States, believe it or not. So because a lot of LARP games were developed out of MIT, like Assassin's Guild, for example, is a book in a world that got developed there as one of the first early rule sets. And then there's Nero, which is a New England role-playing organization. There's Nero, or a classic Nero, Nero Alliance. Um, and then there's Realms. And those are the kind of the classic old ones, but there's hundreds of them, literally. There's Future Imperfect, um, there is uh, Nexus Elements, and there's people emerging and doing LARPs, there's Steam and Cinders, and there's just a large variety. You're lucky to live in New England. You can just pick a genre, and it's available to you. And because LARP is so popular now, there's people coming from Europe to run LARPs. So there's this um, Magiskula, which is a group of people that run kind of an adult Harry Potter Nordic LARP, and that's coming over this June. I'm really excited. I have tickets myself. Um, and they'll be out here. So 
luckily because I think of MIT, because of Google moving in, uh, because of uh, some Harvard people, uh, you know, soon to see General Electric, because the gaming and tech culture people are moving in, luckily there is a support for live action role playing and gaming in this area. So you can just literally get online and pick from your your grocery store of LARPs, where in other areas you'd have to go to another state just to go see one. So if you want a LARP, you win. Uh, and our LARPs are, we have an Etheraz LARP, which is a fantasy LARP, so it's a Lord of the Rings-inspired LARP, which is you know in every other fantasy that we've loved throughout our ages, and uh, telling those Joseph Campbell monomyths. Uh, we also have a very pop, getting very popular infection LARP, which is essentially take your Walking Dead, but you play yourself, so you kind of figure out who you are in the apocalypse and what kind of decisions you make. Um, it's kind of a dark humor satire uh, that has some very scary adrenaline-filled moments. Um, everyone loves that, right? Um, and then that will lead into a Faros LARP, which we're developing, which is dealing with the future that we're going to. I mean, the future is now. We're printing organs. We're talking about getting the people to Mars in 72 hours. Uh, laser propulsion space engines getting to the speed of light. Uh, you know, it's so amazing to be in this iPhone culture that, you know, when William Gibson wrote his... Yeah, and to his books Neuromancer and Philip K. Dick wrote to Androids Dream of Electronic Sheep we're like that future's so far away and like we're in that future now it's about to happen so Faros deals with all the fears of sorry to touch my mic Faros deals with all the fears that we will be addressing as we approach things like artificial intelligence and the responsibility for that or uh, cloning or um, deep space travel and who gets resources and who doesn't elongated life and so that is a very serious, fun, exciting, but uh, kind of scary world that we have. And our n another thing we're about to release this June, we hope, um, is we're going to run Legends of the Stars, which is going to be a Star Wars-inspired LARP uh, that will take place on a battleship. And the idea of that is that the Jedi and the Sith and an Order of Grey Jedi have all decided to come together uh, because they don't agree with what the Sith are doing or the Jedi are doing, and they think they're too extreme and things need to be put in check. Uh, meanwhile, an ambiguous new baddie appears that, you know, can doom everyone, so it kind of forces people to kind of join together um, and dealing with kind of like the politics and thoughts of what it means to be a Sith or a Jedi. And so players can get to be immersed in this kind of, you know, secret rogue uh, UN forming in deep space. Um, so th those are the things that we're playing with, and there's, like I said, there's tons of other stuff out there. Um, I highly suggest if you can find anything by Andrew French, his Lovecraft Legacies events, life-changing, uh, completely awesome. Uh, top 10 on my list besides the uh, College of Wizardry stuff that I experienced in Poland. Um, but again, you know, find your genre, find what you like, and you can try out a game, you know, for a weekend and kind of have that, like, I'm going to camp experience, but as an adult, and uh, have a little bit something extra happen to you, and kind of discover a part of your personality that maybe you didn't know was there, or you just haven't had the chance to bring out a side of yourself, and then get to kind of drive that vehicle and see what that's like. I highly suggest it. Well, well thanks a lot. This yep. is a, has been very informative, and so um, good luck with all your ventures, mm -hmm. and uh, and and uh, who knows, and, uh, maybe we'll be back. Cool. I appreciate it, Len. Thank you. Yeah.